fair tree. Yeah, it's not my first rodeo, Nathan. <laughs> come on. Oh, this, is, this could get dangerous because now you could come up and be like, oh, it's not on. How about that? Whoa. That's sort of fancy. How is everybody this morning? You guys doing all right? Wonderful. Glad to hear it. We have got um, some guests with us this morning, so a very big welcome if you're a guest uh, with us this morning. I was pleased to see that the All Blacks won overnight, so all of the Kiwis are happy. And then I was relieved to see that the South Africans won overnight, so all the South Africans are happy. I didn't want to have a whole bunch of South Africans coming in all doom and gloom with the loss of Argentina, but you guys did cut it close. Very close. Very close. All right. Hey, if you're a guest with us this morning, my name is Josh. It's so cool to have you here along with the team. Uh, we lead here at Activate. We do have a few extra guests this morning because we've got a special Sunday service. We're going to do a baby dedication very, very shortly. But before we do, just a couple of notices. If you want to be kept up to date with what's happening in the life of the church, then you can just jump on to our Activate online Facebook group. You can also sign up for our emails that come out every week. Just jot down your details out in the foyer at our information station and we can make sure that you get kept up to date uh, for things like the prayer meeting, which is coming up tomorrow night down here, 7 o'clock, come down and pray. It'll be awesome to see you down here, so pop on down, 7 o'clock tomorrow night is our prayer meeting. Uh, next weekend, this is important to remember, is our Lounge Church Sunday. And so that means that uh, on the first Sunday of every month, and next Sunday is the first Sunday in August, we don't meet down here. We meet in people's lounges. We've got half a dozen different lounge churches around uh, Christchurch. And so if you would like to be a part of one of those, uh, what you need to do again is just jot your details down out in the back and say, I'd like to be a part of lounge church. And then Dan, who's like our lounge church coordinator, he will get in touch and see where you want to go and what works for you and all that kind of stuff. We love our lounge churches. We love doing churches a little bit differently, one Sunday each month, and giving people a chance to connect in smaller groups and you know, share where they're going. And we love to be able to empower more people to do things like devotionals and share communion and uh, pray for each other and all that kind of stuff. So all that to say, if you come down here next Sunday morning, uh, we're not going to be here. We'll be in people's lounges. So make sure you're up for that. Uh, on the 17th of August, which is a couple of weeks away, we have got a regional gathering. So we are an X church. We're part of the X movement. There are three other X churches in Christchurch. There's Cornerstone in Rolleston. There is City Church on Manchester Street. And uh, just around the corner, meeting right now at Middleton Grange is Equippers, which is also an X church. And so one of the things that we like to do as a movement is two or three times a year, we get together regionally and we all hang out and we connect and we have fun. And our national leader, Sam Monk, will come down from Auckland and hang out with us and our national leadership team who Sheridan, who oversees this church is on and a bunch of other really cool uh, men and women will come down. And so on the 17th of August here, this is the first time we've done it here in many, many years, since I've been here even, uh, we're going to be hanging out here. So you are all welcome to come uh, at, at 7.30, is that right, or 7 o'clock? What does it say? Man, that's tiny font, 7.30, okay. 7.30, down here, everybody welcome. We're going to have a great time of worship and a, a great message and some ministry time as well. So uh, that is happening. Now then, baby, then look at that photo. Wow, what a, what a cute baby. We're, we're about to launch into like, Round three of baby dedications. We have got so many babies. People are popping babies out all over the place. And so this is the start of uh, the next round of baby dedications. So don't be surprised if there are gonna, there's going to be a number of Sundays in the calendar moving forward where there's going to be babies dedicated. But uh, kicking us off uh, this season is Maya Weir. So what I'd love to do is just welcome up uh, Josh and Ioane and Maya, and then also Josh and Ioane's family as well. I know there's a lot of them here. So guys, we're just going to welcome you to come up the front. Don't be shy. Exciting. All right, is that, hey guys, how are you? Very good. You guys all right down that side as well? That's it. Come on up. I won't keep you up here too long. 
Wow, so cool to see the family support for both Josh and Yolane and Maya. Uh, well, what we're going to do this morning, and if you've been a member of this church for any length of time, you will have seen us do this many times, but we're going to dedicate Maya this morning. And so just very quickly to unpack for you guys what baby dedication is and what baby dedication isn't. A baby dedication is not salvation. It's not baptism. It is Josh and Ioane formally recognizing that although they are Maya's parents here on earth, that she does not belong to them. She belongs to God. And the time will come when Maya will make her own decisions about who God is and the relationship that she wants to have with him. But they will be her decisions to make when she gets old enough. So today is about Josh and Ioane saying, God, Maya is yours, not ours. And we're going to do our best to bring her up in your way and to love her as you would. But we recognize today that she is yours. And so we're going to dedicate her back to you this morning. And this is something that we see modeled in Scripture. We see Joseph and Mary did this with Jesus when he was born. In Luke chapter 2, verse 22, it says that when the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took Jesus to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. And that's what we're doing this morning. We are presenting Maya to the Lord. Uh, and so we have got her family up here. Uh, fantastic. But very quickly, I just want to ask Josh and Ioane to share why you're taking this step this morning. Uh, tell me that. Um, the, I mean, yeah, the reason we're taking this step this morning, like, I mean, all through the pregnancy and all through her life so far, we are, um, have been praying to God saying that she is, she's His, she's in His hands, um, that we are blessed to have her in our lives, but He is creator of her he is um the lord over her and this today is in front of family and a lot of friends um that um we are dedicating her to god and we want that like accountability to be like hey guys keep her like keep uh teaching her about god keep her coming to church get her involved in good groups and stuff like that um yeah say anything no what do i see Man, it, it seems such a short time ago that I was marrying you guys. Like, such a short time ago. <laughs> uh, awesome. Well, you, you guys have got both, both dads here today. We've got, we got Mike and we've got Johan. So uh, who would like to go first? Because Johan, I'm saying you're going to read something out in Afrikaans. A short prayer? Yep, sure. And Mike, you've got something to say as well. So do you guys want a paper, rock, scissors, or shall I just go with Johan first because you're here? Mike, you think... <laughs> Hey, Johan thinks Mike's older than him, so. Thanks. Uh, I just got a verse for, um, for Maya. It was a verse that was spoken over us when we got married, and it's Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, Maya, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. We love you, you little bundle of joy. Weet wat ons het is, het is van die af, en dit is nie ons nie. En ons dankie vir die wonderke geleentheid, wat hierdie twee gelovige ouwers, hierdie baba nie kan opdra. En ons dankie, dat u vir ons nie my geleentheid gee, en ons val die goed uit. Ons weet ons verdien het nie, en ons dankie daarvoor. Amen. Staunch South African in down this end. Wow. Very, very good. I remember when when we dedicated our kids, 
So I couldn't even talk. I just had to hand the microphone to Liz and she had to say everything. I couldn't even speak. And you made a rookie mistake. You kept looking at Maya. I'm like, dude, you're making it so much worse. <laughs> right? You gotta like find a spot in the ceiling and just go for it. Like you're looking at it. Wow. This is a significant moment. This is not just ticking a box. You know, this is very, very meaningful. So, we're good to go? Do you and Josh dedicate Maya to God today? Do you and Yoani dedicate Maya to God today? Do you commit to bring Maya up in the faith, teaching and modeling what it is and what it looks like to be a disciple of Jesus? And for the church family, do you commit to praying for and supporting Maya and her parents, Josh and Ioane, over the coming years, spiritually, emotionally, and physically? Yes, that's meaningful too. Do you mind if I just come over here and be gorgeous? Well, we dedicate you, Maya, Alethea May Weir, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, praying that the day will come when you accept Jesus as your own Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, everybody says, Amen. Beautiful. Well done, team. Well done, family. Fantastic. Why don't you give them a round of applause this morning? We have a nice wee certificate for you here, Josh. There you go. Awesome. All right. Like I say, I think at last count we've got another five, another five babies to do over the coming weeks and months. So that is something that you will see again and again. And and who can who was here last Sunday when Kristen Williams spoke? And who can remember the prophetic word that he gave about this church being a church filled with children and young adults and, and young people? Well, that's one of the ways to do it is to just keep having babies, right? It's like a self fulfilling prophecy. So. There you go. Hey, why don't we stand up this morning? We're going to say goodbye to the kids. They're going to pop out. If you're a guest with us this morning and you have got uh, children between 3 and 10 years old, uh, we've got programs running for them out the back this morning. If they're over 10 years old, they're going to be staying in with us today. And if they are under 3 years old, we've got a self-catering creche out there to your right. We've also got a new mother's room as well where you can take care of uh, baby stuff. But why don't we reach our hands out to the kids this morning, something we like to do every Sunday. We're going to bless our children as they go. Father God, we thank you for our kids. We thank you that you are raising up a generation that is going to turn the world upside down. God, we thank you that you are raising up lights of the world to shine in dark places. We thank you that you are raising up, even in this house, missionaries to the corners of the globe. Father, we bless our children. In Jesus' name, we ask that you would protect them, that you would keep them safe, that you would guard their hearts and their minds. And God, we pray for a revelation of your love for our children this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thanks, kids. You head on out to your programs. Thanks to all the kids' workers as well that are helping them. Very cool. For the rest of us that are staying in, we're going to enter into a time of worship this morning. And I just want to encourage you to just take a moment. Just take a moment and focus on Him this morning. Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith. I love that verse because what that verse says is that he started it, and He's going to finish it. Talk about this a little bit later on this morning, but sometimes I think we try so hard to do stuff that God's saying, That's, let me take care of that. What He has started, He will perfect. Yeah, just focus on Him this morning. If you need to close your eyes, close your eyes. Take a deep breath.
just reminded of that Bible verse that says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, present your request to God and the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Just whatever you're stressing about, whatever is causing you anxiety in life at the moment, relationships, finances, job, just, just place it at his feet this morning. Let him give you peace that goes far above all understanding.
us one more time to sing about his holiness. We stand on holy ground. Your presence is here. It is with us. It is in us. And that is the most wonderful thing on earth. Your presence. Thank you, Lord.
Your love is devoted like a ring of solid gold, like a vow that is tested, like a covenant of old. Your love is enduring through the winter rain and beyond the horizon of mercy for today. Faithful you have been, and faithful you will be. You pledge yourself to me, and that's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips.
across the earth, you fill the earth, and I will extol the Lord at all times forevermore, and His praises shall Cross the earth, you fill the Trish had armed out towards him. Just kind of holding her hands there, going, just this is a sign of honor and respect for his goodness. Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Oh Ramai. Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father, for your presence. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, we thank you that you are so good. around the room for a moment. I just I just feel like God's got encouragement on his heart that he wants to share with people. And so I'm just taking a beat and just looking to see who's kind of standing out. I know that God's always got something awesome he wants to be sharing with us individually, but I just feel just to take a moment and share over a few people publicly, if that's okay. Just some encouraging things that God's got on their heart for them this morning. Um, the lady in the, really doesn't narrow it down, in the dress um, part of Joshua or Johanna's family, just there. Can you hide? I just, I just saw you just standing out. I just felt God was just, He was just releasing affirmation over you. And so I'm just going to just declare a few things. I just feel like God's got on His heart for you this morning, if that's okay. Awesome. I feel like God wants you to know, I see His hand uh, and it's big and it's at your back and kind of wrapping around and cupping your back. And I just feel like he's saying, I'm putting my strength around you. And I feel like he's saying uh, just a few things. I'm just going to just speak them out. I feel like God's saying, I'm putting my strength around you. And I'm endorsing the presence of my kingdom within you. The kingdom that's not of this world, but of His making and His design. And I don't know your situation in life around what is easy and what is hard, but I just have this sense of uh, like there's been kind of like stubborn storms in your world that just aren't budging, aren't quite shifting. I just feel like God is is placing His hand as a as like a reinforcement behind you. And I love it. The Bible says like He's our rear guard. And he's, he's your covering, He's your shelter, He's your stronghold, He's your fortress. And I just release right now the affirmation of the Father saying, I've got you. I've got you and I endorse my kingdom within you and I'm covering you and I'm holding you up and I'm wrapping my strength around you in the season that you're in. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. God, we just thank you for your presence. Thank you, Jesus. I'm just going to take another beat, just another moment longer, and just see if there's anybody else that feel like God wants me to just share his encouragement with this morning. Yeah, Tim. I just felt like you just caught my eye, and I just felt like the word excitement just popped into my head. And I just feel like God wants you to know that He's excited about you. I wonder if you're around Him, if you could just stretch your hands out towards Him. God, 
God, I thank you that you loved him with all of your heart. Lord, I thank you that you're excited about every fiber in his being. Lord, we just release your fresh love over him this morning. We release your spirit and your grace just coming around him. And Lord, I just release your kingship over his life, whether there is pain and in his body and his health, Lord God, that you bring all things into your glory and you release your perfect healing over him and strength and energy and vibrancy. But God, I just thank you. I feel like you're saying that you, you love him and you're so excited about him. Lord, we just bless him in Jesus' name this morning with your presence. Thank you, Father. Awesome. I invite everybody just to take a seat for a moment. It's just really nice to hang out in God's presence and not feel rushed. It's just quite a cool thing just to, just to hold for a moment. We've got um, Josh speaking this morning. It should be a lot of fun. I know that he's got a cool word to bring and it's nice for me to be back here. I've been traveling all around the country. Um, so it's nice to see everybody again. Uh, off to Southland uh, this coming weekend and then Hamilton after that. And then I think I'll be back here for a bit. Um, and then away again. But it's nice to say hello and, and say hi to everybody. You guys, man, church is growing. There's so, honestly, so many babies at the back, like Josh was saying, it's crazy. And it was really nice seeing um, the, the young ladies, the girl squad there, and the boy squad here, just nicely segregating themselves. Um, reminds me of the, um, the Alfalfa movie, the He-Man Woman Haters Club, um, back, in the, back in the 90s. And uh, it's funny, but I loved actually just looking across and seeing the younger generation just worshiping Jesus, um, fully participating in what God is doing. And that's, that's just such an awesome thing to see. Um, so that, that, is, that is cool. Hey, um, I won't take up any more time. Let's put our hands together and welcome Josh up this morning as he brings the word. Thank you. Hey, why don't you turn to the person next to you, give them a high five, give them a hug, whatever's appropriate, touch your elbows. Just while I get my stuff sorted. Well, that was quick. Wow. I know. Do you guys want to hear a fun fact? I actually mentioned this to Josh and Joanna the other day. Do you know that if a woman puts on a couple of pounds, it takes five years off the man that points it out? I, uh, I have a habit of coming into church on Sunday mornings. I come in at around 7 o'clock and I like to pray and put worship music on really loud and, um, and then fiddle with the seats and just talk to God about what He wants to do this morning. And then I like to go down to the gym and have a shower and maybe do some exercise. And uh, today I went down to the gym and Michael was down there. It was the most emasculating experience of my life because Michael is... I, I was watching. He didn't know I was watching. I was watching. I was like, how many? Well, how heavy is his weight? He said, oh, that's too depressing to look at. I'm not going to look at Michael's weights anymore because... Uh, Michael is strong, so I sort of strong man. I don't know Michael at all, but what I what I what I do know is that he's very cool. I, th I think you're very cool and incredibly strong. So, so there you go. Um, we are, we're talking about discipleship. We've been on a journey about discipleship because essentially God's talking to me about discipleship. And what God talks to me about, I talk to you about. That's how it works, right? So if God didn't talk to me, then I wouldn't talk to you and we'd have very boring Sundays. So I'm very thankful that God talks to me. Uh, and a couple of times I've tried to talk to you about things that God isn't talking to me about, that I've heard God talk to other people about, which sounds cool. And God said to me, don't talk about that. I want you to talk to the church about what I'm talking to you about. And he's talking to me about discipleship. So that's what we're talking about. Give me a wave if that makes sense. I think I, I explained that very well. All right. We're on this discipleship journey. God's been talking to me about the difference between being a believer and being a follower, the difference between being someone that believes in Jesus and someone that actually follows Jesus, right? And so I thought, let's go right back to the beginning. Let's go back to Matthew chapter four. If you've got your Bibles, and I hope that you do, because otherwise I could say anything. Listen, I've been a Christian long enough that I could say anything and make it sound like it comes out of the Bible. I know the Bible language. You know, yea, verily give 
blessings to Josh. Like I could, I could say anything, it would sound like, that's a bad example, you guys knew I made that bit up, but you want to make sure you got your Bibles, because it's very easy for people to misrepresent things or say things wrong. Well, I'm not going to do that this morning, but I hope you've got your Bibles. Matthew chapter 4. Now, if you've got your Bibles, we want to look at these five verses just to start with, and we're going to stop in at a couple of other verses along the way. We're going to go on a bit of a Bible journey this morning. But in, in my Bible, which is the NIV, uh, this particular passage, these five verses, is headed up, Jesus calls his first disciples. And so because we're on a journey of discipleship, I thought, let's have a look at Jesus calling his first disciples. Give me a wave if you're at Matthew chapter 4, verse 18. You got it sorted? Very good. All right. It's, this is how it reads. It says, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. Or if you've got the King James Version, you will know the saying, I will make you fishers of men. Right, that's a much cooler way of saying it. Love the King James. It says, at once they left their nets and followed him. Everybody say, followed him. Ha <laughs> ha, now I'm a real preacher. <clears throat> Major repeat me, that's what real preachers do. All right, next couple of verses. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Everybody say, followed him. Followed him. All right, I don't know if you guys have picked this up. It's very easy to miss. But we have just seen an extraordinary transformation. We have seen a metamorphosis on par with a caterpillar forming a chrysalis around itself and then bursting out a butterfly. We have seen a massive change in five verses. Did you pick it up? In verse 18, Peter and Andrew were fishermen. Ordinary, everyday, run-of-the-mill, salt-of-the-earth men. They went out, they caught fish, they brought them in, they sold them. They went out, they caught fish, they brought them out, they sold them. They did it day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. They were fishermen at the start of verse 18. By the end of verse 20, they are no longer fishermen, they are disciples of Jesus Christ. Verse 21, James and John are fishermen. Ordinary, run-of-the-mill, everyday, salt-of-the-earth people. One verse later, they are disciples of the Son of God. What happened in those five verses? What qualifications did you see them earn in those five verses? What Bible college, what seminaries did they attend in those five verses? What boxes were ticked? in those five verses. What's the one thing that those four men did to move from fishermen to disciples of Jesus Christ? It's not a trick question. What is it? They followed him. They followed him. That's the only thing that changes in those five verses and it moves them from being four men that we would never in a million years have ever known, ever existed in the history of the world to becoming household names if you go to church. Probably did more along with the other apostles and of course Jesus Christ, but they did more than any other group of men have ever done to change the course of human history. And it all changed in those five verses because they followed Jesus. We've been talking a lot about discipleship, and I love the definition of discipleship that we've got, which is that discipleship means to actively, like it's an active thing, it's not a passive thing, it's not a theological thing, it's an active thing. You're actively and intentionally, like on purpose, deliberately, with focus, you are imitating Jesus Christ until you become a living copy of Him. That's the most accurate biblical, Old Testament, contextual definition for discipleship, as Jesus meant when he talked about it. To actively and intentionally imitate Jesus Christ until we become a living copy of him. But you know what? I understand it's not that catchy. I understand if you're not getting up in the morning and repeating that mantra. I understand if you haven't committed it to memory. It's a little bit, like I've committed it to memory because I preach it so often. But I get if it's not something that's tip of the tongue for you guys. So let's simplify it right down. Here's an easier one for you. Discipleship means follow Jesus. Who thinks they can remember that? 
get up in the morning, this, this day, I am going to what, Tabitha? Follow Jesus. That's right. When I get to work today, I'm going to what, Ron? Follow Jesus. Hmm. It's, it's, it's that simple. And yet at the same time, are there two words in the English language that is easier said than done? Like, I, I wish I could tell you that following Jesus is like the easiest thing in the world, but my gosh, it is not. It is not. How many people have ever felt like following Jesus Sometimes you're like, I feel like following Jesus is harder than not following Jesus. Have you ever felt like that? A lot of hands. Thank you for your honesty. We're an honest church, right? We're a vulnerable church. We're like, we're a real church. Yes, sometimes following Jesus is hard. And when you look at the, the requirements that Jesus put on discipleship in Luke chapter 14, it's no wonder it's hard sometimes because Jesus was like, hey, there's three things, right? I preached about this a couple of months ago. There's three things Jesus says in Luke 14 that you have to have if you want to be my disciple. Number one, I've got to be the most important person in your life, bar none. I must be your top priority, Jesus said. Write it down in your book, Luke 14, go and read it later. I've got to be more important to you than your mum, your dad, your brother, your sister, your husband, your wife, your kids, your friends. I have to be your top priority, bar none. That's the first thing he said. Second thing, he said, you need to pick up your cross and you need to take it with you everywhere you go. Because there will be times when things pop up in your life that get in the way of you following me. And what we're going to do in that moment is we're going to stop right there, we're going to nail it to a cross, and we're going to kill it. So you have to have your cross with you at all times. Because when that thing pops up, that pride, that ego, that selfishness, lack of generosity, whatever it might be, when that pops up, we're going to stop, we're going to nail it to a cross right there, and we're going to kill it. That sounds fun. And then the third thing he said was, also, before I forget, everything you have is mine. Being a disciple is not easy sometimes. I was talking with a friend of mine once, good friend, very mature Christian, been in church for a long time, and they were just, they'd had a bad day after a long run of bad days, and they were just unpacking and venting to me, and they were being genuine. They weren't being, you know, they weren't exaggerating the situation. They were like, this is how I genuinely feel. They were like, I just feel like I can't, I've just got so much going on right now. Like I've got, I'm, I'm married, so I've got to deal with you know my marriage. I'm a parent, so I've got to worry about my kids. I've got a job, and I'm trying to you know achieve there and please my boss. And then on top of all of that, I've got my own emotional needs to worry about. I'm not eating properly. I'm not sleeping properly. I'm not getting enough exercise. It's this whole spiral. And then they said, and on top of that, on top of that, they said, I have to be a bloody Christian. Pardon my French. They were like, it's just, it's, it's like a whole, it's like another thing on top of it, right? And now I've got to feel guilty about not reading my Bible. And I've got to feel bad about not praying. And I've got to have conviction about not being generous with my finances. I've got, it's just like, it's, now it's just another thing that I'm failing at, another thing that I'm not doing well, another person that I'm letting down. Have you ever felt like that? Yeah. How many people would agree that that's not God's intention? When Jesus said, follow me, he doesn't want people 2,000 years later going, I've got to be a bloody Christian. Pardon my French, I said it twice. Not as bad as lucky though. <laughs> here's, here's the thing. Not only is it not meant to be like that, Jesus deliberately made a way for us to not have to go through life like that. In Matthew chapter 28, Jesus is just about to go up to heaven and he leaves his final instructions for his disciples. And it's up there on the screen. It says that Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples. So Jesus is very specific. I want you to go and I want you to make disciples. And then just in case you're a little bit like, I don't know what that means, Jesus. Like I kind of picture that maybe the disciples and the people that were gathered there kind of gave him a bit of a confused look like, what, you know, I need more 
information there. And so Jesus kind of unpacks it a little bit. And he says, okay, you're going to teach them. First of all, you're going to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. And then you're going to teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. So Jesus defines discipleship as you baptize people in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then you teach them to obey my commands. That's discipleship. You, you, you do what Jesus says to do. You follow Jesus. You with me? Obeying Jesus' commands, that's discipleship. And I want you to hold on to that because if we jump over to John chapter 14, and I told you we're pinging around the place a little bit. In John chapter 14, Jesus is kind of bringing his disciples into this, this picture. He's starting to talk to them about what life is going to look like once he's gone. Jesus knows that he's going to go to the cross, he's going to be crucified, he's going to be resurrected, and then he's going to go to heaven. And he's starting to just gently just reveal a little bit of that to the disciples. And he's starting to have conversations around like, okay, this is what it's going to be like when I'm gone. It's kind of like if you're, a, you're an older person and you know that your time is coming to an end, you start to pull people around you and you start to talk about what life's going to be like once I'm gone. And so this is what John chapter 14 is all about. Jesus is talking to the disciples about what life is going to be like when he's gone. And he says this, he says, if you love me, keep my commands. Or another version would say, obey my commands, or observe my commands, or guard my commands. In other words, what Jesus is saying is, you know, if you love me, follow me. Remember in Matthew chapter 28, Jesus talks about discipleship being, observing his commands and following his teaching. So he says, if you love me, be my disciple, follow me. Very next verse, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is hanging out with his disciples. They're talking about what life is gonna be like once he's gone. And Jesus says, hey, look, I need you to keep following me. Even after I've gone, I need you to observe my commands. I need you to follow my teachings. I need you to be my disciples even once I'm gone. And then Jesus says, and hey, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask the Father to send you the Holy Spirit and he will help you. Because Jesus recognized that we can't do what he's asking us to do by ourselves. Does that seem logical to you? Like if I, if I said to Janet, hey, I need you to do this for me. I'm gonna leave, but when I leave, I'm gonna get someone to come and help you. That would sort of insinuate that Janet needs help. Otherwise, I would have said you're fine. So the fact that Jesus says, hey, I'm gonna go to heaven and then I'm, the first thing I'm gonna do when I get there, guys, I'm gonna ask God to send the Holy Spirit and he will come and help you. You know, that, that, um, the Greek word that the NIV translates advocate is a Greek word called parakletos. And out of everything I did putting this message together, the most time that I spent was trying to work out how to put the little wee line above the E and the dash above the A I'm not even joking, I Googled that like five times. There was all these different people. You gotta do it like this way, if it's a Macintosh this way, if it's a Word document. You gotta like hold down Alt and push the number code in. I, I spent more time doing this slide. You guys don't appreciate it, but I did. The Greek word is parakletos, right? And parakletos, it means one called to stand next to you as a helper. I love that picture. That Jesus says, hey, when I go, I want you to keep following me. I want you to stay on on route. I want you to stay on the track. I want you to continue to be my disciples, but I'm going to send someone and they're going to stand next to you and guide you through it. There's a lot of different definitions for that word parakletos. And so that's why in other translations, it's sometimes counselor, it's sometimes comforter, or it's sometimes encourager, it's sometimes intercessor, it's sometimes helper. But the truth is, it's all of those things combined. Sometimes the English language doesn't do a great job of representing, you know, the Greek or the Arabic or the Hebrew. But this idea that Jesus says, I'm gonna send someone and that someone is gonna stand next to you and they're gonna guide you through life and they're gonna give you advice and they're gonna help you do what only they can do. How many people know, I won't put it up on the screen, Romans chapter 12, verse two. Do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
There's two things that I want to tell you this morning. Very simple. Because I think sometimes preachers try and cram like a whole bunch of stuff into one message, but I don't have to do that because I pastor here, and so we can just carry on this conversation in following Sundays. So I'm not going to bang a whole bunch of stuff into it. There's only two things that I want you to really start to shift your mindset on. Number one, you are called to be a disciple, not a believer. And what I mean by that is that that Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 4. We've got half the verse up on the on the wall there. He's talking about the fivefold ministry, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. Their job is to equip and nurture and prepare all the holy believers to do their own works of ministry. And as they do this, they will enlarge and build up the body of Christ. Next verse, 13, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. That's the goal. That's the whole point of the equipping of the saints is to bring us to maturity. Verse 14, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching. Verse 15, instead speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. Listen, you got saved, that's awesome. We believe in Jesus, that's awesome. But that's not the finish line. That's the start. We then dedicate our lives to becoming like Jesus and growing and maturing in the faith. And I would suggest to you, this is the second mindset shift. So the first one is, I'm called to be a disciple. I'm called to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Jesus stands in front of every single one of us and says the exact same thing that he said to Peter and Andrew and James and John. He says, follow me. And we have that same choice. And you'll notice if we bounce back to those verses, both Peter and Andrew, both James and John, it says they left everything and followed him. And we have that same choice. We're called to be followers of Jesus Christ, not just believers. And the second mindset shift that I want to bring is that you cannot follow Jesus Christ without the Holy Spirit. And Jesus knew that. And that's why Jesus sent the Holy Spirit. And that's why Jesus said to his disciples, I'm sending the Holy Spirit, or more specifically, I'm going to go to heaven and ask Dad to do it. But when I get there, I'm going to ask Dad to send the Holy Spirit to help you to counsel you, to comfort you, to encourage you, to intercede with you, to help you. I was walking up my road um, just this week and I was talking to God about it. And I was talking to God about, you know, following Him and all this kind of stuff. And, and God said this to me and I just, I loved it. He said, how do you follow someone who can walk on water? I can't do that. Can anyone do that? I can't do it yet. That's right, Jean. Yeah, ask me next Sunday. How do you follow someone who can walk on water? How do we do the things that Jesus did? How do we become the person that Jesus was? And I'm not even talking about all of the supernatural stuff and the healings and the miracles and the signs and wonders. I'm not talking about any of that stuff that Jesus said, hey, you will do greater things than these. I'm talking about how do we just be kind like Jesus was kind? How do we compassionate? How do we be loving? How do we be caring? How do we be filled with grace and mercy and all that stuff? I don't even think that's possible without the Holy Spirit. And I think sometimes we almost give ourselves aneurysms trying to be this perfect Christian instead of going, you know what, I can't do it. And so the second mindset shift is I can't follow Jesus Christ without the Holy Spirit. I was up in Coromandel, last year and I've shared this with a few different people but it was it was meaningful to me and we had I've talked about this we had the worst holiday of our life like it was 17 days it, it rained the whole time my granddad died in the middle of it I had to fly back home and then fly back up we just couldn't unwind and I was carrying all of the stress and just fatigue because it had been a big year and I was the longer the holiday went on and the worse the holiday got the more anxious I got about the fact that the holiday wasn't doing what the holiday was supposed to do. 
And, and I was worried that I was going to come back from the holiday and be even more stressed and more tired and more anxious than I was before. And unlike before when I had a holiday to look forward to, now I'd have no holiday to look forward to because I just had a holiday. I'm stressing myself out now just telling you guys about it. And it was the last day, and we went to a beach and the sun came out. Miracle. And even though I should have been happy, I was like, great, comes out on the last day. Thanks, God. Right. But kids were playing in the water. Liz was reading a book. I said, I'm going to go for a walk. I just need some space. And so I walked down the beach. And on the left-hand side of me was the ocean. And on the right-hand side of me was this big cliff. And there was, you know, trees sticking out of the cliff randomly because that's what trees do. And there was some vegetation and tussock and stuff up the top of the cliff. And, and I was walking. I was getting close to the end of the beach because there was a whole bunch of rocks that came out. And I couldn't. They were too big to climb over. So I was going to have to stop and turn around and go back. And I'm getting close to the end. And I'm talking to God. And I'm like, God, oh, my gosh, God, this holiday has been so horrible. And I'm going to have to go back. And I've got a pastor church. And I've got a, you know, this is before we even opened up the cafe. But, you know, I've got, I've got a dad and I've got kids and I've got church and I've got a couple of other jobs that I'm doing to try and make ends meet and it's tight and, oh, my goodness, Lord, what am I going to do? Like, it's just, I don't know if I can do this. Like, it's just, there's just too much to do. It's just, there's just too much, God. And I said to God, I said, what, what tell me what to do. Like, what do I do? How, how do I navigate this, this next season? And as I said that, I was, I was sort of looking up and this hawk just popped up off the cliff. I couldn't see it before that, but it just came up off the cliff and it caught my eye and I looked at it and this hawk just hovered. I don't know if you've ever seen a hawk fly. They must be one of the laziest birds in the world, hawks. They just, they hardly ever flap their wings. We have hawks out by our place and they, they land in the middle of the road to eat the roadkill and they're so lazy that they just make you drive around them. They don't even move out of the way now. It's just amazing. But I'm looking at this hawk and it's just, it's got its wings out. And it's just riding the air current. It's not flapping. It's not striving. It's not trying to, you know, push against the wind. It's just catching it. And I looked at it, and God said to me, he said, do that. He said, let me do the work. He said, stop trying to do everything. Just ride the wind of my Holy Spirit. Let me give you one more example of the difference between Holy Spirit and not Holy Spirit. So last Sunday, and then what I'll do is I'm going to get the band to jump back up and we'll do a little bit of music and some praying for people. But last Sunday, I don't know if you guys noticed, it rained quite a bit. In fact, the whole weekend, it rained quite a bit. And out where we live, uh, we got like completely inundated with water. We had people out in our neighborhood that couldn't even get to church because they couldn't get down the driveway. And my wife was like, stuff that. I can get my car through this. And she also has been wondering for a long time whether there's a bit of an inner chitty chitty bang bang in our car where you can just ride into water and then the pontoons kind of float out and you can just... So she thought she'd give it a go. It was awesome. And then I got a phone call because I was down here at 8 o'clock. She said, my car's dead. I said, why is the car dead? She said, oh, I, think, I think there's water in the engine. I said, how, why is there, are you sure? Yeah, where is it? In a lake, kind of thing. You know, so drove the car through the water. So we were down to one car. Fortunately, Denise, who's not here this morning, she's up in Hamilton, she said, I've got to go up to Hamilton after church. You can have my car. It's great. So we left it here on Sunday. We went home. And then on Tuesday, we came back in for our staff meeting. And I said to Liz, you take my car, go home with the kids, do all your errands and homeschooling and stuff. I'll go grab Denise's car. Went out to grab Denise's car, didn't realize it was a manual. No, 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 no. Now, that's not, that's not what it's about. It's not what it's about. This is not another manual driving story. I want to tell you right now that I drove that car for the last five days, not one bonny hop, not one stall. Like, it was, yeah, it was good. I, I almost wanted to post on Facebook and let you guys all know. That's not my point. Here's the thing, though. It was parked out the back of church. And I hopped in, and it was parked out the back, and it was facing, facing the front. So I hopped in, put it into first gear like a pro, and then I drove it out, and I parked it right out there, up against the green ledge. And I was like, I wish someone had seen that. That was awesome. And I came in, and I said, right, I'm going now. And then I went out, and I hopped in the car, and I went to put it into reverse. I could not get it into reverse. I couldn't, it's like, I'm like, it's, there's the R, it's right next to the first gear, second gear, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, reverse, no, no, no. I'm like, you know, ha, ha, ha. 
Unless I put in, like clutch, clutch, would not go. So if I put any more pressure on this, I'm going to snap the gear stick in half. And so I'm like, what am I going to do? There's only one thing I can do. I've got to put it in neutral, get out, push it backwards. <laughs> so I put it in neutral. I'm out there. And I go around the front. And I'm like, you know, and I'm like pushing it. And then just then, God thought it'd be funny to send a guy from next door out. So he comes out and he goes, are you all right? Now, I'm not proud of this, but there is no way that I as a 40-year-old male are telling another man that I can't get it into reverse. I turned to him, this is your pastor, on church property. I turned to him and I said, mate, it's my mate's car, and every now and again, it gets stuck. It can't get into reverse. It's like a problem with the gear stick. It's, you know, and I, I have to push it like this. And he laughed, and I laughed. I was like, I know, it's, he's such a loser, my mate. Like, you know. And I fully lied to him because I couldn't admit that I didn't know what I was doing. And then I, hopped, I pushed it right back. And it's a little car. It's still a lot of work because there's no one in there, like, steering it or anything. So you, like, push, and then... And I hopped in, and I had to drive to a meeting in town. The whole time I'm driving to the meeting in town, I'm like, Jesus, please give me a car park that's forward-facing so I can just pull in and then drive straight out again. And I get to where I'm going, and all the car parks are up against a fence. I'm like, great. So I park there, and I get out, and I'm like, this hunk of junk car that Denise has given me. Like, so I go, and I do my meeting, and I come back out, and I'm like, oh, here we go again. And I put it into neutral, and I go around. I'm pushing it back. Oh, my gosh, this is so stupid. Hop back in the car and I drive to my next meeting. And again, I'm like, God, please give me a front facing car park. I don't know how long this would have gone on for. I would say the whole week. Except I checked my messages and there was a message from Denise and it said, Hey, if you want to put it into reverse, there's this little black switch under the gear stick. You just got to like flick it up to get it into reverse. I was like, <laughs> So I hop back in the car for my third meeting. And I just flicked this thing and put it into reverse. It was like, it was so easy. It was so easy. Just put it into reverse. I just felt cried. I was like, oh my gosh. I spent, I spent the whole day pushing a car around instead of just flicking the little wee black thing under the gear stick to get it into reverse. And do you know what? I think that that's a great picture. Afterwards, I was like, thank you, God, for making that happen to help my sermon illustration. I kind of sensed that was it when I was doing it, so I didn't get too stressed about it. I think that's how we, we live as Christians sometimes. We are pushing and pushing and pushing, and it's hard and it's tiring and it's frustrating, and then it rains and you're like, this sucks, why is it so hard? It's not me to be like this. And the whole time Jesus is saying, I, I've given you a black switch. Just all you gotta do is flick this switch. And then it's, it's easy, get the band to jump up. And that, that black switch is the Holy Spirit. And I think that, you know, we talk a lot about how, how I think one of the issues in church is that the church is filled with people that say they believe in Jesus, but they don't follow Jesus. The church is filled with believers, but not followers. But I don't think it's because people are in church and they don't want to follow Jesus. I don't think the church is filled with people that are like, well, I don't want to follow Jesus. He's stupid. That's, you don't come to church if you're like that. I think the church is filled with believers that want to follow Jesus, but they don't know how. Or they've tried and they've failed. And they've tried and they've failed. And they've tried and they've failed. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read my Bible every day. You get three days into it and then you fall off. Oh, it's just too hard. I'm going to get up early and pray every morning. I'm just going to do it. And then you go, oh, it's just too hard. I'm struggling with this particular addiction. I'm just going to, that's it. I'm just going to cold turkey. I'm not doing it anymore. And then the next week you do it again. And you're like, oh, it's just, it's just so hard. And you fail and you fail and you fail over and over and over again. And in the end, you just end up sitting in church going, I can't do that. I've tried to follow Jesus. It's too hard. But we, we try to do it without the Holy Spirit. And I think that's where I think that's where churches perhaps need to look in the mirror and go, well, are we teaching our people this? You're called to be a follower of Jesus Christ, not just someone who believes in what he said. You're called to do what he did. You're called to talk the way that he talked. You're called to live the life that he lived. 
That's what we sign up for. But you can't do it by yourself. That's why Jesus said, I'm gonna send you the Holy Spirit. You'd be amazed the difference that it makes to try and do life with the Holy Spirit. And I'm sure you've got a whole bunch of questions like, well, how do I do that? What does that look like? How do I you know, hear the Holy Spirit? How do I do life with the Holy Spirit? What does that mean? All these questions. And like I say, we're not gonna get into all of that this morning. I just wanted to tell you two things. You're meant to be a follower of Jesus and you can't do it without the Holy Spirit. Those are the two things. Remember I told you a couple of weeks ago that I was walking down my road and I was talking to God and I saw a table in front of me and there's a whole bunch of stuff on the table. And I, I saw God standing behind the table and He said, you can have anything you want. What do you want? Well, I'm still doing that with Him. Not, not every day, but a lot of days I'll go for a walk and, and the table will be there. And an interesting thing happened this week. I went for a walk and the table was there and I said, God, I need this and I need this. And for the first time, God said, can I suggest something? Like a salesman would. I had I had this conversation that I had to have last week and I didn't wanna have it. It was gonna be a difficult conversation, I thought. Turned out to not be a big deal at all, but I was carrying a little bit of anxiety about it. And so I, I stood at the table, metaphorically speaking, in my mind's eye, and I said, God, I need some courage. I'll take some of that. I said, God, I need some wisdom. I'll have a, a bottle of your wisdom, please. I said, God, I need some discernment. And I said, thanks for all of that. And then he said, can I recommend this little bottle of humility? He said, this, this is what you need. Okay. So I took the bottle and I just prayed. I just said, God, I'm gonna take that bottle of humility and I, I need you to help me be humble. I can't be humble by myself. I need your Holy Spirit to help me with my humility. Sometimes it's as simple as just saying, God, this is what I need. I can't do it without you. Holy Spirit, I need you to help me with this. You don't need to be hearing bolts of lightning from heaven. It's just going, God, I need this. I can't do this without you. Help. He sent a helper to help us. And if you're sitting here this morning, you're like, man, sometimes I feel like this Christianity thing is too hard. I'd say it probably is too hard if you're trying to do it by yourself. If you love me, Jesus said, keep my commands and I'll ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever, to stand beside you, the spirit of truth. Discipleship, there you go, the Holy Spirit helps us follow Jesus. I think what we'll do this morning, because I don't think you can talk about this kind of stuff and then be like, have a great Sunday, see you later. I think we need to create space for people to respond um, I'm gonna ask Jared to help with this as well because he's actually got a lot more experience in this than I do. Actually, do you, do you wanna take over from here? What are you feeling? Yeah, you can do that. Yeah, I'm going to humbly pass the microphone over to Jared because he's better at this than I am. And he couldn't drive manuals when we were younger and I was living in my big brother's shadow with a lot of insecurities. I used to say, you know, it's got the word man and manual for a reason. And then I married Raina and she could drive a manual better than me. And I was like, well, there it is. As Josh was just um, speaking into those last few moments, it felt like God just dropped the word distinguished into my mind. And sometimes I think that we can struggle with feeling like we're just a drop in the bucket in God's world. And what I felt like His Holy Spirit was saying was, I'm, I'm distinguishing you. 
you're individually, incredibly, uniquely made and designed by me, but when my Holy Spirit comes around you, you're gonna feel like you stand out in my presence. And you're gonna to begin to capture the revelation that I've got eyes only for you. And that sense of being distinguished creates a level of dignity around you in your walk with Christ, where God begins to place honor on you with His presence. And when God begins to, you begin to have that revelation that when I have the helper come around me, it is the greatest sense of honor that God could bestow on me. And so when we have this moment going, God, I need your Holy Spirit. God is so eager to give His Holy Spirit. You might have been filled with the Holy Spirit before. I love Josh and I were chatting about this the other day. He just had some question. He goes, can you ever have the fullness of God? You know, why do, we, why do we get constantly be filled with His presence? And you know, if we think about the fact that God has no beginning and He has no end, it's not like we get filled with Him and now we have Him. He is constantly flowing through us like the difference between a river that is always flowing or a lake. God is like this constant flowing river of living water because He doesn't have a beginning and He doesn't have an end. We never actually have a uh, all that He has to offer us, we keep just receiving more of it. The Bible says that He pours out His Spirit without measure. Because how can you measure something that you can't quantify how much of it is? You can't give 10% of something that is limitless. All the logical thing you can do is to pour it out continually. And that's the heart of the Father's generosity, I feel this morning, is I'm going to distinguish you with my presence, that you begin to realize I have eyes only for you. And that revelation as you begin to catch yourself in the eyes of the beholder is gonna release a dignity over you where you begin to walk with the honor of God and that empowers us in our relationship with Christ. And so this morning, I'd love us to take a moment and you can come up to the front or you can stand where you are depending on how much space is left up here. But I wanna lead us in a prayer of receiving presence of Holy Spirit and even repenting from unbelief in some cases as well. I'm going to lead us in some prayers and we'll come along, we might lay hands on you because the Bible talks about laying on of the hands and imparting things. We might do some of that, but really when Holy Spirit poured out on Pentecost, it was just a group of people that were in the room who were fervently hungry to receive the promise that Jesus had made to them. So let's stand right now and if what I was just sharing then kind of resonated with you, especially around that sense of being distinguished in the presence of God, the intimacy of a real relationship with Him that goes far beyond a religious experience, but into something that is tangible and real. And if you feel like, man, I need to have an awakening in me that the Holy Spirit is for me and real and around me and wants to flow daily through me, being poured out consistently by the Father without measure. Mercy is being made fresh every day. Holy Spirit being poured out on us every day. Then I wanna just invite you up to the front and I'll lead us in some prayers as we just encounter His presence. So if that's you, then just let's just come up right now. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, we hunger for your presence. We hunger for your presence. Mighty helper. Jesus. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Jesus. If you want to come up, come up boldly. Don't uh, linger halfway up or something like that. It's an exciting thing to step into the presence of God. To say, God, here I am. God, there's nothing that I want more than you. God, you give meaning to this life and without it, it's totally meaningless. Holy Spirit, the relationship that I desire for you has to be real. It can't just be ethereal. It has to be daily. It has to be intimate. It has to be authentic. It's got to be genuine. It needs to be powerful. 
Holy Spirit. God, we just, we just thank you that you're a good, good Father, that you're pouring out your presence this morning. This felt like Holy Spirit was saying that there's some people here and you feel though you, you are unworthy. You're unworthy to carry a spirit that is so holy. And if you're struggling with that feeling, I actually wanna lead you right now in confessing that out to Christ as a lie and asking for His forgiveness for partnering with that because He makes you worthy through Christ crucified and resurrected, He makes us worthy. And so right now, if there's you, then I'm just gonna lead you right now in a prayer to help unlock expectation and hope for you in receiving more of the Holy Spirit. So that's you, just place your hand on your heart right now. Just repeat after me, Jesus. I confess the lie that I am unworthy to be filled with your Holy Spirit. I ask for your forgiveness for believing that. And I thank you for the truth that because you forgive me and make me clean, I am worthy. There is nothing I could ever do to earn your gifts. I just receive you now because you are so generous. Holy Spirit, God, we just thank you right now for your presence in this room. Holy Spirit, God, we just thank you. We release your Holy Spirit. We just ask you, breath of God, just come along and just begin to breathe on people. Just begin to breathe on people and just releasing your presence. Releasing your presence right now. Just say, Holy Spirit. Just repeat after me. Holy Spirit, I open up my life to you. I ask you to fill me. I surrender my barriers and I lay down control. I ask you to fill me and consume me. I receive you as my teacher, my comforter, my counselor, my helper, my guide. I submit myself to you. And I receive you now through Jesus. Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm just going to pray in tongues just for a little moment. Now, speaking in tongues is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It's our heavenly language. And if you can speak in tongues, I, I encourage you just to just begin to let it flow out right now. Just one of those gifts of the Holy Spirit as we just honor God with His presence, with the heavenly language. Iaram sundor basandara basandara man. Iorom sundor basandara man. If you can't speak in tongues, you get me. I'd love to operate in that gift, Holy Spirit. Then just right now, where you're standing, just say, Holy Spirit, would you give me that, please? Can you give me the gift of speaking in a heavenly language? And just begin to just, just ask Him for that, and then just begin to move your mouth and allow Him just to have sounds come out. It's a spirit language. It comes from our inner being, not from our mind and our intellect, but it's something that bubbles up out of us through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. 
And as we begin to just do this corporately, it begins to encourage the people around you. So if you can speak in tongues, it's kind of like right now what we're doing is we're just fanning the flame. James says to stir up the faith that's within, to fan the flame. So you speak in tongues, just begin to let that bubbling out as an encouragement of those around you who are wanting to receive this gift from the Holy Spirit. Just begin to model it to them. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, she a ramo sondor of a sandarama, ki a ramo sondarama, Holy Spirit flowing, Holy Spirit flowing, Holy Spirit flowing. Thank you, Jesus, she a ramo sandarama. Thank you, Jesus, for your presence building. Ki a ramo sondor of a sandarama, Jesus, she a raka sandarama. If you're now just in the space and you're going, man, I really want to be able to speak in tongues. And I'm just now just beginning to just by steps of faith, just beginning to step into this. If there's shit, then what you do is I want you to raise your hands. I'm going to ask people that can speak in tongues to just come pray over you and release an impartation of Holy Spirit to you. So if that's you and you're, you're doing this right now, this is kind of like our, our moment of humility going, yeah, I want to do this. And I'm going to put my hand up in front of people because I'm hungry. And my hunger for it outweighs my social nervousness. So that who's here right now? They go, man, I'm hungry for this. And I want more. Awesome. There's one person there. Can we have somebody, one or two people just go pray there over Steve? That would be great. Just go pray over him. What you're going to do is just going to pray and go, man, we just release you, Holy Spirit. Is there anybody else? Because, man, I want to be able to flow in this gift. Awesome. Tim, just here. We have a couple of people just come and pray for Tim. And what you're going to do is you're just going to speak in tongues and say, I release Holy Spirit. Gene, you want to come over there and join him? That'd be fantastic. And what we do is like uh, you're carrying Holy Spirit in you. So you are carrying a living flame. And if you go to light a fire and you've already got fire in you, it's really easy. I lit a campfire the other day and I was so lazy. I actually just went and got a big shovel and picked up some hot embers from my fire inside and I took it and I just chucked them on the on the dry wood outside because I couldn't be bothered starting from fresh. So when you've got Holy Spirit in you and you're praying over people, He is flowing from you. The kingdom of heaven is within you and out of obedience when you pray in tongues over people that are hungry for you, you go, I release you right now, Holy Spirit. You are releasing the fire and the flames of God onto the dry timber of their life that it will begin to explode in life and passion. Is there anybody else who goes, man, God, I just, I, I want to be able to speak in your tongues. I want to be able to move in freedom and power with you. Is there anybody else who just go, man, I've got some dry timber and I want to see it come to life. Awesome. Young ladies, you love to, just, Tabitha, just come around here and just pray in Holy Spirit. Pray in Holy Spirit. Maybe Liz, you can come pray there as well. That's fantastic. Is there anybody else? Is there anybody else? All right. Feel free now just to stretch your hands out towards the people that have responded. We're just going to begin to just declare life and power through Holy Spirit over them. Holy Spirit, just stretch your hands out now. This is a participation moment, not a spectator moment. Holy Spirit, we release your fire right now. We release your fire. We release your fire, Jesus. Holy Spirit, release your passion and your glory. Jesus, Jesus. And just like, if you need to shoot off, you need to go grab tea or coffee, you can, you can roll on out at any time. You're 100% released if you've got things you need to go and do. But I just felt right now that there are people here and you've been struggling with fear and you've been encountering nightmares. And Jesus wants to set you free this morning from a spirit of fear and intimidation that is uh, be giving you nightmares and, and causing uh, ungodly stress in your life. And if that's you, then I just want you to come and just stand over here. And I'm just going to pray for you and release the love of God. Because the Bible says that the perfect love of God casts out all fear. Great. Just come over here and pray, with, pray for you. If there's a couple other people, there might be more than one person that you're just struggling in this space. Just come on my hand and I pray for you. 
course, all is free. Feel free to face me. You don't need to face everybody else. Thank you, Jesus. We just release right now. Fire. Fire. Holy Spirit. Fire. Fire. Oh, Romo, Sia, Rama, Sandara, Makia, Robo, Sandara, Spirit of timidity and intimidation, I break you right now in Jesus' name. I release the blood of Jesus Christ breaking off every assignment of fear and witchcraft that has set itself up against you to torment. And I release breakthrough right now in Jesus' name. Right now in Jesus' name, I release the abundant love of the Father that casts out all fear. I release the love of the Father that casts out all fear in Jesus' name. I will declare right now peace and glory right now in Jesus' name. Harrison, you guys got any anointing oil in this church? Jesus' name, and I declare the mind of Christ. 